Welcome to Sacred Treks, a show where we take Star Trek as a sacred text to see what life lessons we can take away from the franchise in order to help make us better people. So today, let's explore quite literally my favorite Star Trek The Original Series episode, Balance of Terror, through the theme of kinship. This is Sacred Treks. Space, the final frontier. 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 It does not matter that we will never reach our ultimate goal. The effort yields its own rewards. <laughs> a human being dead. A single act of compassion can put you in touch with your own humanity. Loss of life is to be mourned, but only if the life was wasted. My child's was not. The most profound discoveries are not necessarily beyond that next star. They're within us. Your father was captain of the starship for 12 minutes. He saved 800 lives. And I dare you to do better. You are Starfleet's captain. You believe in service, sacrifice, compassion, and love. The past is written, but the future is left for us to write. And we have powerful tools, Rios. Openness, optimism, and the spirit of curiosity. The needs of the many. Outweigh the means of the few or the one. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to boldly go where no man has gone before. Let's start off, as always, with the synopsis of Balance of Terror. You know, where I make a sarcastic summation of the plot of the episode, in order to remind us that while we are taking Star Trek as sacred and is something we all love, it is not a perfect work, as nothing is. The Enterprise is having a wedding, and Kirk gets to be master of ceremonies. Also, apparently Scotty gets to walk the bride down the aisle because she must be so meaningful to him. So meaningful that he never mentions her ever again. and looks like she's getting married to a baby-faced Kirk. Too bad a red alert interrupts everything. Turns out that the Enterprise is guarding the neutral zone between the planets Romulus and Remus, which, considering that we learn in Star Trek Nemesis that Remus is literally right next to Romulus, the Enterprise should technically be in orbit of Romulus right now. But yeah, you know, canon, right? <laughs> Spock gives the crew, and wouldn't you know it, the audience, some well-needed exposition on the century-old Earth-Romulan War, and the fact that no human has ever seen a Romulan. Also, we learn that humans cannot violate the Neutra Zone or risk war. But Outposts 2, 3, and 8, for some reason, have all been mysteriously destroyed. Also, it turns out the Enterprise's latest navigator, Styles, had a lot of ancestors that were lost in the Romulan War. Though that, that probably won't come up in any way. Kirk and the crew watch as Outpost 3 is destroyed by a Romulan bird of prey, which suddenly disappears right afterwards. But the ship may also not be able to detect the Enterprise, so Kirk pretends to be an echo on their sensors. Styles points out that there may also be Romulan spies aboard the ship, though he has no real basis for that whatsoever. I'm pointing out that we could have Romulan spies aboard this ship. But again, I'm, I'm sure that's not going to come up at any point later on in the episode. Getting an incoming code, the Enterprise is conveniently able to get a look inside the Romulan ship, which is a power that never comes up again, by the way, in the entire rest of Star Trek. But oh my god, it's Sarek! Spock, your dad's a Romulan! Oh my god, holy crap, that's going to shake your entire worldview! Wait, sorry, this was before Mark Leonard was cast as Sarek, so um, uh, apparently Romulans just look like Vulcans. Styles suddenly gets very starey at Spock for some reason, distrusting him because of how he looks, and gets a tad racist all of a sudden, allowing Kirk, though, to have one of his best lines ever. Leave any bigotry in your quarters. There's no room for it on the bridge. Sarek, I mean the Romulan commander, assumes the Enterprise is following. Also, can we talk about how colorful the Romulan ships are? It's so purdy! It turns out the Romulan commander has been sent out to provoke a war with the Federation, hoping to go to ship like the Enterprise into attacking them. Back on the Enterprise, Styles argues that they must attack quickly or risk war, though he gets very angry at Spock. But Spock agrees with Styles, stating Vulcan's warlike past. Vulcan, like Earth, had its aggressive, colonizing period. Savage, even by Earth standards. And if the Romulans retain this martial philosophy, then weakness is something we dare not show. It's almost as if Star Trek Discovery's idea of Vulcans attacking first was actually in line with canon. Hmm. 
The Romulan commander doubles back and tries to attack Kirk, but because Kirk has gone off course to attack the Romulans as well, they both fail in their attempts. Yet their phaser fire damages the Romulan ship, killing the Romulan commander's best buddy. The Romulans fire back, but the Enterprise does a full reverse somehow, causing the Romulans' weapons to dissipate over distance. But don't worry, Yim and Rand gets to hold on to Captain Kirk, so it's all good. It's, 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 it's a nice moment. Is that Starfleet regulation that humans must hug their captains in battle? As the Enterprise follows the Romulans into the neutral zone, Sarek throws debris and his friend's body into space to distract the Enterprise, causing them to lose track of the ship. Both ships power down and wait for nearly 10 hours in order to hide, though why is everyone whispering? He is there. Somewhere. Sound doesn't travel in space. Kirk hangs out in his quarters and doubts himself in front of McCoy, but McCoy gives one of his best lines ever. In this galaxy, there's a mathematical probability of three million Earth-type planets. And in all of the universe, three million million galaxies like this. And in all of that, and perhaps more, only one of each of us. Don't destroy the one named Kirk. Dang, McCoy, sometimes you can be inspiring as hell. While repairing the bridge, Spock makes an uncharacteristic mistake and activates his crazy x-ray thing, causing the Enterprise to be detected and Styles to get all racistly starey again. The Romulans place a nuclear warhead in some wreckage, damaging the Enterprise badly as well. The Romulan commander, who now believes he has won, reluctantly is persuaded to destroy the Enterprise. Back on the Enterprise during repairs, Styles gets all racist again, which ends up saving Spock's life as a coolant leak erupts after Spock leaves. Spock rushes back into the room, saving the crew members and Styles, and causing the phasers to fire just in the nick of time, basically destroying the Romulan ship. The Romulan commander hails Kirk and states, I regret that we meet in this way. Before self-destructing the ship, Kirk goes to sickbay to find that Spock has saved Styles' life, who is humbled. But Spock was unable to save the baby-faced Kirk, the guy who was getting married at the top of the episode, remember him? Kirk goes to comfort the sadly no longer gonna get married fiance. Well, maybe now she can get married to Scotty. Eh, maybe don't do that. We both have to know that there was a reason. Often, when people talk about this episode, the first thing that they bring up is actually not kinship, but the theme of prejudice, and it's hard not to see why. Styles clearly distrusts and prejudges Spock simply based on the fact that he looks similar to the Romulans which gets intensified with Styles' history of having family who were killed by Romulans decades earlier in the Romulan Earth War. But I want to look at this concept through the opposite end of the spectrum, through kinship. Who do we consider to be our kin, our brothers, people who we share a bond with? How do we denote that we share that bond? Well, to do this, we need to look at ideas of race and power. In Falgunny Seth's book, Towards a Political Philosophy on Race, Seth discusses liberal societies, or societies with certain basic assumptions at their heart. Ideas of equality for all citizens, democracy, and the rule of law. These are all values that we know that Starfleet and the Federation espouse, a society that celebrates the diversity and difference among its citizens. The Federation and Starfleet accepts everyone, and believes in everyone's equality despite their differences. But Seth argues that the tendency of a liberal society is not to preserve those ideals, but instead to preserve its own power, and then by extension, those ideals of equality for all. Yet this creates a paradox, because in many societies, they may preach equality for all citizens, but often historically and systemically exclude many people from those very ideals. Think of how the United States Founding Fathers talked about equality for all while excluding black people from that discussion. Or how about today when the United States still systemically does the exact same thing through over-policing and brutal use of police force, voting right limitations, and much more. According to Chef, sovereign powers, or those in charge of these societies, try to preserve their power by making exceptions to their ideals, by creating creating the unruly, those who are deemed unpredictable, undependable, or threatening to political order. And this isn't done randomly. The unruly are chosen because they stand out. If you wear signs of your religion, for example, or speak out against systemic injustice in society, or you question basic assumptions of identity, then you may be deemed unruly, or even more importantly, are just perceived to be unruly. So we have these people deemed unruly, but how do we actually classify them? 
Well, the idea of the unruly are created through a process known as racialization, or the process of delineating a population in contrast to a dominant population in a corresponding political tension. Basically, the sovereign power, those in charge, delineate a specific population, be it people of color, transgender people, LGBTQ people in general, Jewish people, or any other group, and says that they are a different group, and creates an in-group, out-group mentality. Sovereign powers say, well, you shouldn't be like these people. Sovereign powers create this distinction by giving a group a distinguishing feature. Again, we just talked about it earlier. It could be a physical feature like skin color or ear shape, but it could also be a religious status or an economic status like poor people. Or it could actually give them these distinguishing features like making them wear a star or a wristband. And what's more, these groups have to be already vulnerable, making it easier to push them out, maybe build off of a pre-existing political tension. But here's the interesting bit. We replace those distinguishing features and make them markers of unruliness. It's taking a distinguishing feature that was, again, either given to them or just something that people have and using that to delineate them as unruly, different, and then a threat. That's what racialization does. But the real reason, and let's not forget that, that people like black people are racialized, at least in a systemic way, isn't because of the color of their skin. It's because they have been deemed as a threat, quote unquote, to liberal ideals by sovereign powers. But racialization erases and hides the idea of unruliness by saying that that distinguishing feature, whether it's skin color, race, or sexuality, for example, is the threat in and of itself. But that is not true. Now, I know all of this sounds incredibly confusing. I know it's a lot of heady theory, and I will link to a philosophy tube video up here that will help explain it a little bit more better than I can here. But let's bring it back to Star Trek, because we can see this racialization right in action. Spock is a character who is seen as part of the in-group. In fact, he's exactly as much a part of Starfleet as anyone else. He stands up for Starfleet and the Federation's values of equality and rule of law, perhaps more than anyone else on the ship. Now, completely separately though, there exists a pre-existing political tension and a deeming of unruliness in the Federation against Romulans. As Spock says, Earth believes the Romulans to be warlike, cruel, treacherous. The Romulans, for all intents and purposes, are deemed unruly by the Federation based on the pre-existing political tensions created by the war that happened decades earlier. They're seen as threats to the values of Federation society based on brotherhood, rule of law, and equality. The Romulans are seen as unruly and a threat to the ideals and self-preservation of the Federation. Yet, here's the interesting bit, there is not a distinguishing feature to place on the Romulans yet, as we learn, because no humans have ever seen Romulans before. So when we finally do get to see the Romulans for the first time in this episode and learn that they have pointed ears, a distinguishing physical feature that separates them from the majority population of Starfleet, we see racialization instantaneously happening. You run away from them and you guarantee war. They'll be back, not just one ship, but with everything they've got. You know that, Mr. Science Officer. You're the expert in these people, but you've always left out that one point. Why? I'm very interested in why. On theories about a people we've never even met face to face. We know what they look like. Yes, indeed we do, Mr. Stiles. You link this idea of unruliness in the Romulans to the physical feature of ears, and then you bring it to Spock, who shares that physical feature. Despite Spock sharing many values with the Federation, it's not about the values that someone holds, it just becomes about the physical feature that distinguishes them as unruly which now includes Spock because he shares that feature with Romulans. Through this fact, we can see the inherent artifice of race and the assumptions, prejudice, and bigotry that comes along with it. Spock is no more quote-unquote unruly or a threat to Federation's values than anyone else, yet he is deemed to be by Styles simply because of his physical features. Spock now faces multiple points of racialization. He's often pushed out simply by being a Vulcan on a ship full of humans, his emotionist list often being used as his distinguishing feature of unruliness on the ship. But now he also faces racialization with someone with a similar distinguishing feature as Romulans. This fulcrum places Spock in a precarious position, one where he is heavily scrutinized. He has to become a perfect arbiter of his race, one of the good ones not make any mistakes to prove that he isn't unruly to everyone else on the ship. I joked earlier about Stiles staring at Spock, but it's an effective metaphor for what society does to those who have been racialized. Why do you think communities of color, for example, are overly policed? Because society over-scrutinized racialized communities, trying to keep them in line, to keep them from seeming unruly. It's also a form of control. But in the episode, Spock makes a simple mistake, a mistake that any of us could have made. He pulls a switch. And this seems to prove to Styles that Spock is a spy, a Romulan, a bad one. 
This time we'll handle things without your help, Falcon. Keep in mind that, and again, anyone could have made this mistake. It's not a qualifier of unruliness. This is the same thing as if when a white person commits a crime, it isn't because he's white, but when a person of color commits a crime, it's definitely because they're a person of color, quote unquote. It also means Spock has to prove himself more. Styles eventually comes to like Spock after Spock saves his life. But Spock shouldn't have needed to save Styles' life in order to earn his respect. Spock was a distinguished, decorated officer. He was Styles' superior. He should have already had Styles' respect. But Spock needed to put his own life at risk simply to earn the basic respect that he should have been given by Styles beforehand. So yes, I just broke down how racism works, so why didn't I make the theme of this episode race or prejudice? That's because this episode also highlights something else, about how we could view ourselves not through race, but through shared ideals. You see, the Romulan commander at the end of the episode dies by saying this. You and I are of a kind, in a different reality. I could have called your friend. For the Romulan, he sees a kinship with Kirk because, in many ways, they share the same ideals, the same values. While the Federation and Romulans are sovereign powers, societies that create unruly classes and have deemed the Federation and Romulans as differing unruly powers against each other, with in-groups and out-groups based on political tensions and distinguishing features, what really matters to these two men, Kirk and the Romulan commander, are the values they share. Kirk and the Romulan commander share more in actuality than their political differences might show. One can see that we have a lot more in common than we think. And it's also worth noting that the opposite is true, that racialization, shared history, also creates its own form of kinship and community. Spock, as we later learn in The Next Generation, devotes his entire later part of his life to reconciling Romulans and Vulcans because he feels a kinship with them despite their differing values. So Spock tries to create that community, a community based on shared values, in order to uphold that kinship that he feels through racialization. You also see the same thing with LGBTQ people, for example. Speaking as a queer person, the queer community is incredibly diverse, yet we all share many values and try to uphold them because we have been grouped together by racialization and our shared prejudice banded us together, thus creating the very community that we have. So in the end, what we learn is that racialization, the seeing of differences between people based on pointless factors, is an artificial tool, something created by groups in power in an effort to preserve their own power, not their ideals and that these racial effects have clear implications for those who feel them. But if Star Trek shows us a way to look through this, it's that we must all learn to try to look through these pointless distinguishers to find the real truth. That ideals of equality, freedom, and respect for diversity can transcend those insignificant differences between us and the struggle for power. And that we must all work together in order to fight back against those systems that try to keep us apart. Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more Sacred Treks and other discussions of Star Trek and geek topics. Also, you can comment. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. I also run a couple podcasts, one called What the Frell and Star Trek Behind the Lines. Those are a lot of fun, so you can check both of those out. But if you don't subscribe or comment or any of that stuff, I just hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, especially Ashley Allen Bokikio, Miranda Janelle, Eli Berg Moss, Ashlyn Solstice, Christina Dalliance, Greg Gillum, Stephen Clinard, Munir Amlani, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Wayne Twitchell, Ish the Mad, Buttoneer, Randy Thompson, Jemshin, Lorena Mesa, Mari Neckar, Wellington Marcus, John Steele, Michael Beam, William Stewart, Gavin Robinson, Jason Knott, Maeve, Subraxis, Tonya Trummer, Wen Dizzle Bizzle, Gretchen Badger, Dante St. James, Polly Mina, Piston Twisted Garage, and Bree Beecher. Thank you all so much for your continued support.